How are your eyes out there? How many fingers am I holding up? Can you tell? Well, do you have healthy eyes? Do you have a good eye? What exactly does that mean? To me, it means can you judge quickly whether a ball is going to end up out of the strike zone or whether it's going to be in a place where you can hit it? Or does it mean that you have a keen eye for style and for decorating? Or maybe you can pick out nice things while still watching for the best prices? In just about any context, questioning whether you have a good eye means asking if you look at the world in the right way and take in accurately the things that are important. Well, two weeks ago, we were challenged to see that even when we feel like we only have a little, we still have enough for God to work with. And last week, we scanned the vast horizon of all the stuff that we have and admitted that we usually have too much stuff and too, health, too unhealthy of a relationship with it. But we were also given again the hope that if we offer our stuff to God, God can use it together with others to meet the needs of those around us. Well, this week, we turn to look behind the question of what we have or what we don't have to look at what we most desire and what our hearts long after. We come here to the realization that the point isn't just giving things we have to fulfill our responsibility or to check off some list or even to make someone else feel better. The point is that God wants us. God wants our hearts. God wants all of us. This point floods the whole section of Matthew that we read from this morning. It's all part of the so-called Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus begins with the Beatitudes and continues on teaching through chapter 6 by teaching that if we have anger stored up in our hearts, then it's as serious as committing murder. And if we have lust stored up in our hearts, then it's the same as being unfaithful. Basically, whatever rule we follow outwardly is also meant to bring our hearts in line with God's heart. Now, in our passage today, this is applied to wealth and resources. As Jesus observes that what you value in your heart will correlate to where you put your value in the outward part of your life. This is a truism that we can all see in our own lives and we see reflected in so many of the stories in our society. I think of the movie saga Indiana Jones where Indy's father never spent time with him because he was so focused on the elusive treasure hunt for the Holy Grail. In turn, and Indy has learned from his father. He is portrayed throughout the rest of the movies as placing so much value on recovering treasure, so much value and energy on the challenge of the hunt, that he seems incapable of having normal relationships with people or putting the same value on them. In contrast to that elusive pursuit of the world's treasures, Jesus tells us that God wants us to put our value on the things that God values, rather than what is temporary and of no lasting meaning beyond the horizon of our own interests. And so that brings us around to eyes. In light of the importance placed on our heart condition, the next session a section of our passage invites us to ask whether we have a good or healthy eye or whether we have an evil eye. At first, this probably comes off as a kind of murky saying about what kinds of stuff we let into our eyes. But it makes more sense when we realize that the pre-modern people thought of eyes in a little different way than we do. They weren't windows, like we may think of them, but they were sources of light 
think headlights instead of a windshield. They thought of it like eyes gave off light to let you see or make out or illuminate correctly what was in front of you. Here, the good eye that gives off light to see correctly is in direct contrast to the idea that we're maybe more familiar with, the evil eye. All over the ancient world, people would use an evil eye to give off curses in jealousy, in an effort to ruin the happiness of someone who offends you or to gain satisfaction from their loss. I think of this whole way of conceptualizing what eyes do with the image that's given us in the Lord of the Rings saga, where the watchful eye of the evil spirit Sauron is always looking across all of, little, all of Middle Earth. Perched from a high tower, it's like uh, the light, the searchlight in a lighthouse, inspecting everything in sight in search of the object of its desire, while also giving off a beam of energy that could turn things to do its will and its desire. So there we have pictures of the good eye and the evil eye. Well, this concept of having a good eye of light or evil eye of darkness also could operate on a deeper symbolic level in the ancient world. Metaphorically, if your eyes don't have light to give off and to see things rightly, the ancient Jews would say it's because you don't have a generous spirit inside. Instead, you harbor inside jealousy and greed and a consuming spirit that causes you to see with an evil eye, which sucks the happiness and the charity and the life out of whatever you experience. On the opposite side, having a good eye means that God's light is in you to help you see things with generosity, looking to give life to what you see. So God wants to work in you to give you an eye that sees like God sees, to have God's desires, to look at the world the way that God looks at the world, for with an eye to building the world up around you, not with an eye to use it for your own purposes. And that's why it's important to distinguish what kind of eye you look at the world with, not just simply the external things that you do to get along. Well, this reminds me of one of my favorite stewardship stories in church. In a certain small church in Scotland, people were being harped on to give more and more and put more in the offering plate every week, but they didn't respond from the heart. Thus, the church had to run an announcement in the bulletin which read, Will those of you who have been putting buttons in the collection basket Kindly put in your own buttons and not those from the church upholstery. (laughs) We'll be counting how many buttons are left on the pews after this, but that's a ridiculous level to which things sunk in that church. But it can remind us that it's not just simply giving something or giving more that pleases God. It's not that going through the motions of giving is what fulfills God's uh, wants for us. What pleases God is our heart condition behind our treasures and behind what we give. So where is your heart this morning? What are you treasuring? What are your desires and dreams When I think of getting people to dream big dreams, like our stewardship campaign is trying to do this year, I can't help but think of the blockbuster movie from a a few years ago called Inception. Now, if you haven't seen it yet, you probably should, because for an action thriller, it's a movie of tremendous scope, visually, and tremendous ideas. Picture for a moment, a larger-than-life scene of buildings rising before you and going down forever in a long, big city 
uh, scene. And then suddenly those buildings keep repeating and then suddenly they start folding over on themselves like a big board game. Well, if you see that when you're standing next to Leonardo DiCaprio, then you know that you're in a big dream world that has just gone out of control. And that's an image that typifies this movie. The plot of the movie involves planting false ideas in people's minds through controlling their dreams. So the movie preaches that you need to be careful where your dreams come from. Do they come from true or false sources? Do they come from wrong or right desires? You also have to be careful to keep a clear distinction between what is dream and what is reality so that you don't get lost in your dreams and lose reality. Well, this theme bridges our scripture passages for today and pulls out their meaning that when our dreams are based on earthly treasures, earthly power, greed, temporal things, then they, became, they become easily misleading and easily dashed into pieces. But when our dreams are based in the honest desires of God, they lead in the right direction to what is fulfilling and to what is not easily shaken. The book of Ephesians that we read earlier can proclaim that God is able to do more than we can even imagine or request in our wildest dreams because we're assured by experiencing God in Jesus Christ that God's love is more extravagant and powerful and unlimited than we can even fathom. But the author's experience also assures us that this powerfully extravagant love is at work in us through faith. God wants us, God wants to use us in doing the vast things that God dreams, not by forcing us, but by working with the Holy Spirit deep within us. Again, even our wildest dreams are meaningful and realizable when they're in line with God's wildest dreams and desires. So even though it may at first seem strange and a little out of whack that we're being urged to dream big by our stewardship campaign this year, that's only strange if our dreams are based on temporary, earthly treasures and desires, which will end up being frivolous. But if we step out to dream in prayer and study, based on God's desires as they're revealed to us, then we're simply opening ourselves for God to work out those big things through us. In some of the concrete examples that we've been offered the past few weeks by our stewardship committee, those things could be put to us like this. If we're just dreaming of a narthex renovation so that we have an elegant and comfortable place to hang out after worship and gaze at each other's navels, then that would be misguided and frivolous. But not if we see the narthex as an integral piece of how we welcome any person who sets foot in this building. Something we should consider as the Barna Research Group suggests that people decide whether they feel comfortable in a church within the first two minutes of entering and through the first few people that they interact with. Well, if we identify welcoming people into community as a value that God desires, and if we commit to integrate this value into all forms of our life, then sending a clear message of welcoming through the appearance of the narthex becomes a big dream done out of God's big desires. It's the same way with the dreams we've heard from the mission committee and the other committees that we'll hear about. If we just want to feel good about the percentage of people who are doing hands-on things to help those in need, then we're being a little vain and selfish and frivolous but not if we're dreaming out of God's desires to pass love on most fully from person to person, and if we believe that God values relational giving so much that God gives God's self to us in the person of Jesus Christ, well, then we see that sending personal hands-on help 
with our financial support is an important part of God's big desires that we should put at the heart of what we do and who we are together. When we look at the world and when we look into the future, we end with the question, do we have eyes to see God's big desires and big dreams? What does it mean for us to bring our hearts and our treasures into line with God's big dreams? Let us open ourselves daily to how God's Spirit is working within us, working to give us the right desires and dreams and eyes so that we can live each day a part of the unimaginable and extravagant great things that God will work to bring about. For God's glory in the church and in the world and throughout all generations.